First Timothy chapter two. We're going to be looking at First Timothy chapter two, verses one through six. First Timothy chapter two, verses one through six. I there I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayer, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. We think about salvation as it relates to men and women throughout the world and throughout all time. We find that there are four classes of people in the world. There are those who are unconcerned about salvation. They just really could care less. Then there are those who think they are morally good enough to be saved without obeying the gospel. There's plenty of those to go around. Then there are those that believe that they are too wicked, that they're too sinful to be saved. And then there are those who learn and obey the truth. But, you know, it it doesn't matter which class of people you might fall into. God still desires you to be saved. God wants that. Our text demonstrates that. There are four fundamental facts that all men must face. Number one, all responsible people are lost if they are outside of Christ. All people are responsible for their own conduct and they will be accountable. God's desire is for all men to be saved. Many, many really can be saved. In fact, everyone can be saved if they so desire. Salvation. There defines Salvation, the Greek word for salvation is, means to rescue from danger or destruction. Save from punitive wrath of God at judgment of the last day. Webster defines it delivered from the spiritual consequences of sin. And really either one of those definitions are sufficient for our study. The Bible Definition is found in John chapter 3 and verse 15. Whosoever believeth in him, talking about God, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Should not perish. We're being saved from perishing and we are given eternal life. Well, what does perish mean? Well, back to there, it means to incur the loss of eternal life, to be delivered up to eternal misery. It's generally known as the wrath of God. Those who perish have to face the wrath of God, Romans 5 and verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from his wrath Through him. That's talking about Jesus. Through Jesus. If we are not saved, then we will perish as we face the wrath of God. But our text says God doesn't want anybody to be lost. He wants everybody to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so we're going to offer some evidence that God doesn't want anybody to be lost he wants all to be saved the fact of the matter is that there is only one god and he's the creator of all go back to genesis chapters one and two we find in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and then chapters one and two describe that process 
He just, just, just really, everything in existence owes its existence to God's creative power. In Acts chapter 17, verse 28 and 29. For in Him we live and move and have our bringing, as certain uh, also of your own poets have said. For we are also His offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's devices. The Bible, from beginning to end, demonstrates that God is our creator. John chapter 1 and verse 1, speaking of Jesus, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God. And everything that was made was made through or by Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. So we owe our existence, our very existence to God. But God created man for a specific purpose. And that's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Now Solomon writing this has put himself to the, the mission of finding the meaning of life. And being in a position of unlimited wealth, special wisdom from God. He looks at everything that this life has to offer under the sun. In other words, without God. And he finds without God, everything is vain. And so here at the end of the book, he's telling us the conclusion that he's reached. Let us hear, he says, the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work unto judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Hebrews 12 and verse 9, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? And so the purpose, our very purpose is to fear God and keep his commandments. And we should willingly and readily accept his correction so that we can live according to his will. We can, we can act in such a way as to be pleasing to him so that in the end we'll have eternal life in heaven because we'll all stand before his judgment seat. So we have one God, our creator, who loves us, who expects certain things from us. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, he makes provision for all to be saved because of his love, because of his mercy, because of his grace. But the fact of the matter is, according to Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, we are in need of salvation. It's unfortunate that according to some man-made doctrines known as Calvinism, that many have been led to believe that God doesn't want to save everyone. That there are only an elect few. Those that were predestined, that were foreordained before the foundation of the world, God chose them to salvation. And that's a fixed number. And that's an arbitrary number. There's no rhyme or reason for it. He just said, you're going to be saved. And to the rest, he arbitrarily said, you're going to be lost. And there's nothing you can do to be in one group or the other. You're just there because God puts you there. And if you're in the group that's going to be saved, there's nothing you can do in order to be lost. That's their teaching. And if you're in the group that's going to be lost, then there's nothing that you can do in order to be saved. You're just lost because that's the group in which God put you. It was arbitrary, without meaning, without reason. It was based on what they called the sovereign will of God. 
He's God and He can do whatever He wants. And that's what He wants. And because the elect are a few, right? That when Jesus died, He didn't die for everybody. He didn't die for the whole world. He only died for the elect. They call that limited atonement. It's a pretty sad doctrine to think of God in those terms that He would arbitrarily condemn someone for eternity to a devil's hell for no reason other than it was His desire. That's not a loving, caring God. The God I worship, the God I serve, is the God that loved the whole world. Not just part of it. Not just the elect, but God loved the whole world. And because He loved all the whole world, all men of all time, He gave His Son. And the reason that He gave His Son is so that we could have eternal life. That whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Notice it's whosoever. It's not limited to a certain number that are saved. It's whosoever. We have one Christ who is mediator for all. A mediator is a go-between. He goes between parties that are at odds with one another, that are at variance. And he's familiar with both sides. And the purpose of the mediator is to bring peace, to bring those two parties back together. And as we've said, all have sinned. Romans 3, verse 10 and verse 23. Galatians 3 and verse 22, but the scripture has concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given unto them that believe. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and verse 10. It says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Some people are deceived into thinking that they don't have any sin. And others, it says, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. That's verse nine are all unrighteousness that's verse nine then verse 10 if we say that we have not sinned ever we make him a liar we make god a liar and his word is not in us sin separates us from god the wages of sin is death romans 6 and verse 23 isaiah chapter 15 i mean verse 50 chapter 59 verses 1 and 2 Teach that our sin separates us from God. We need God's help. We want Him to hear our prayer. But if we have sin in our life, that separates us from the help and the prayer that we can offer to God. He knows our weaknesses, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. This is 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. God doesn't want us to sin. He's done everything in His power to encourage us not to sin. However, we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And He goes on, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And then the next verse said, who died as a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, not just for the saved, not just for the elect, but for the whole world. Doesn't sound like God's salvation is limited in its offer. It's available to everyone. Jesus died for everyone. As a mediator, He's trying to reconcile us to God. He's trying to bring us back together with God. And He died on the cross and shed His blood to that end. He was tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin. 
In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Jesus knows what we're going through. That was part of the reason that the second person of the Godhead took on human form and lived among us so that he could learn firsthand what we're going through. We have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeding of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we, yet without sin. Jesus knows what we go for. He's the perfect mediator. He understands our side because he's lived it. He understands God's side because he's deity. What better mediator could we have? One ransom, Jesus died for all. Remember that big fancy word propitiation a while ago? That just means that Jesus paid an adequate price to appease the wrath of God. And that's what we're trying to avoid. Right? So we don't perish. Jesus died to free men from the slavery of sin. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. For sin shall have not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Jesus died to liberate us from sin. The slavery of sin. He died to liberate us from the guilt of sin. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews 10 and verse 17. And their sins and iniquity I will remember no more. Once again he says the same thing. Freedom from condemnation and consequences of sin. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. We don't have time to read through Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 through 12. But that simply says that Jesus died vicariously for us. Vicariously means just that he suffered on our behalf. Jesus was bruised for our iniquities. Yeah. He bore our sins on the cross. There's one testimony, one gospel. And it's for all. God's power to save men. Romans 1 and verse 16. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is God's power unto salvation. He describes the teaching of the gospel in Romans chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren. I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved. We're saved by the gospel. Can it get any plainer than that? And he goes on, he says, by which you are saved, if you keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the basic message of the gospel. Jesus died for us. He died in our place. He died for me. He died for you. He was buried, but he didn't stay in the grave. He was raised the third day. That's the message that we need to be preaching. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day. That's what we need to preach. That Jesus did that to save sinners from a devil's hell. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. Jesus died as a propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. 
We need to learn the truth. A sinner needs to learn the truth in order to be saved. If God wants man saved, as we've seen, one must learn the truth in order to be saved. Did God give the truth so that we can learn it? And the answer to that is yes. He sure did. God created us to serve Him. When we failed at that and turned into sin, He sent His Son as a mediator to die on the cross to shed His blood to redeem us from our sins. That's the evidence that God wants us to be saved. That He wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Could He not do it? If God wanted us to give us a message about salvation, could He do it? And the answer to that is yes. This would challenge, if He couldn't do it, this would challenge the greatness of His power. And if he could do it, wouldn't he do it? If there was a message that God could give us to save us from our sins, don't you think he would do it? And if he didn't, that would be a challenge to his goodness, to his love. That would make him deficient in his attributes. If he couldn't do it, he'd be deficient. If he could do it and didn't do it, that would make him deficient. And if he's deficient in any of his attributes, he ceases to be God. If, yes, if there is one message of salvation that is offered to all men for all time, then denominationalism is wrong in asserting that one cannot know the truth and that all you need to do is be honest and sincere. In John chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 18 and verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. John chapter 1, verse 14 through 17 says, and the word was made flesh. Remember we talked about John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God. Well, then in verse 14, the word was made flesh. And dwelt among men. And we beheld the glory as of the, glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying that this was he of whom I spake. He that comes after me is preferred before me for he was before me and of his fullness have we all received and grace for grace for the law was given by Moses but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ we can know God's will he has revealed it to us and we can know it What must I do to be saved? That's a question that we ought to all be concerned with. It's asked three times in the Bible, in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, And when they heard these things, they were pricked in the heart, and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? In Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, this is Saul of Tarsus. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord told him, Arise and go to the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Acts chapter 16 and verse 30. The Philippian jailer thought his prisoners was going to escape, and he was ready to kill himself. And Paul said, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And he said, sirs, he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? The answer depends on your condition when you ask. If you are a believer, you need to repent and 
be, or, or, or rather a believer who has been outside the body of Christ, then you need to repent, confess, and be baptized. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. As a Christian who's gone back into sin, you know, God still wants you to be saved. And he's made provision for that. Repent and pray, Acts chapter 8 and verse 22. That's what you need to do. We've been concerned with salvation requirements for the alien sinner. But the Christian must add the Christian graces. In order to be saved, there are certain things we need to do, obey the gospel. In order to stay saved, we need to continue to live according to the will of God. But we need to add the Christian graces, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. We need to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 6, verse 20 through 22. And we must not neglect our salvation. Last verse, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard him? God wants all men to be saved. It's in his nature. He's made provisions by offering his son on the cross. He's given us testimony in the New Testament so that we'll know about what he has done for us and we'll need to know what we need to do in response to that. We've seen that. We need to hear and believe the gospel. That's where the power of God to save is. And that is available to all men. Don't be so arrogant to think you're not in need of salvation. Don't be so arrogant as to think that you're so good that you don't need the gospel. Don't think that you are too wicked or sinful that you cannot be saved. But know this, that God loves you. He cares for you. He's done things that make it possible for you, you to be saved. In fact, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. So this morning, if you're subject to the invitation, if you're outside the body of Christ and you need to obey the gospel, or if you're a Christian in need of salvation, that you've gone back into the world, and into sin, and you need to repent and pray, we'll be glad to help you in any way if you'll come forward while we stand and sing.